So first of all, express the quantity uh, up there in seconds, in nanoseconds. Um, this is one straight from the book. So how many nanoseconds, or how many, yeah, how many nanoseconds are in a second, or, or vice versa? How, how, how did you think about that? It's 10 to the negative ninth uh, seconds is one nanosecond. All right. So uh, remember, yeah, and, and so if you didn't know that, please, please make sure to learn those metric prefixes, both the small ones and the big ones, um, as many as you can. But, but try to get them pretty small, because we're dealing with pretty so small stuff. All right, so if that's the case, then you can do this just as a regular conversion, or you can kind of just do it in your head if, you look, if you're good with moving the decimal around in scientific notation. But let's actually write it out. So this is going to be 556.2 times 10 to the negative 12 seconds times 1 nanosecond per 10 to the negative 9th seconds. So if you divide now. 10 to the negative 12th divided by 10 to the negative 9th means you subtract the exponents. So that's going to leave us with 556.2 times 10 to the negative 3 nanoseconds. All right. uh, significant digits, significant figures stay the same since we're just changing the magnitude. All right, uh, human fat has a density. This one was also right from the book. How much volume is gained by a person who gains 10 pounds of pure fat? Well, we need to figure out how much volume 10 pounds of fat takes up. And to do that, we use density. So first off, we have to do a bit of a unit conversion here, right? What, what's that? What do we have to convert? Pounds to grams. Pounds to grams, because our density is reported in grams, but this is reported in pounds. Alternatively, we could also convert this gram to pounds and do it that way. But either way you go, you have to have the same units on both sides. So let's do pounds to grams. We can say 10.0 pounds times, and we use our conversion down here, um, 453.6 grams per one pound. Okay. Uh, we'll multiply that together and get 4,540 4, grams, right? Three, three significant figures because of the measurement in the pounds. So that's how many grams of fat we have. Now to get the volume that that takes up, we can use that density as a conversion factor. And we can say point 918 grams per one cubic centimeter. That's the density. The grams will cancel, and you're left with uh, cubic centimeters, which is what? Does anybody remember or have that number? I don't actually know what it, what it is. Do you have that? Mm. That can't be right. 4.94 times. OK, OK. <laughs> so 4.94 times 10 to the third, or 4,940 uh, cubic centimeters. OK, uh, another conversion. The density of iron is given there in grams per cubic centimeter. What is its density in pounds per cubic inch? So this is a straight ahead conversion where you set up the different things. Um, 7.86 grams per one cubic centimeter. And it doesn't matter which order you do this in. But one thing you're going to have to do is convert cubic centimeters to cubic inches. That factor is not given, so how do you do that? Yeah, you have to actually cube these. So if one inch equals 2.540 centimeters, you can't say that one cubic inch equals 2.540 cubic centimeters. You have to actually cube it. So 2.540 centimeters cubed 
equals, can anybody punch that out real quick? What is it? 16 point, uh, we'll say 39 cubic centimeters. So one cubic inch is 16.39 cubic centimeters. So we'll use that conversion next. We'll say 16.39 cubic centimeters in one cubic inch. All right, so that takes care of our cubic centimeters. And then we need one more factor to convert the grams to pounds, we, as we just did. So we've got 453.6 grams per one pound. And we're going to report that number with three significant figures. Um, does anybody have that or want to punch that out quickly for me? Hundred. Yeah. Okay, do that. Uh, so 129 pounds over 254. Okay, so the final density in pounds per cubic inch. Point two eight four pounds per cubic inch. Well, that's not one twenty nine. Oh, this isn't right. One twenty seven point eight four two. One twenty seven point eight four two. Seven point eight six times sixteen point okay. three nine. Okay. Let's get that right. Okay, so it's one twenty eight point eight. Yeah, so one twenty nine with significant figures. So we're just rounding. Because you can only use three significant figures in that oh. in that calculation. Yes. We can round it You can round at the end. And I think it gets you at least within the error, right? Because yeah, if you're within plus or minus one of the last digit, you're always OK. OK, because I, I round at the end. Yeah, yeah, that should be fine. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, speaking of that, when you're doing your mastering chemistry stuff online, which I've, saw, I've seen a lot of people uh, get started with, so that's great, um, especially getting into chapter one and chapter two stuff, they're fairly lenient about significant figures, but it's the same kind of rule. If you're off by more than one or two of that last digit, it'll usually, it might not count it right. If you're within it, it'll say you're right, but you did something wrong with your significant figures or something like that. So it's pretty good about that, but if, if you're having trouble, let me know. Okay, and then uh, here we have a temperature measurement to convert to Fahrenheit. So what did you call this measurement here? Anybody? Yeah, 36 point, uh, how would you report that? 36.60. 36.60, yeah. That's one that would be okay. So you know for sure it's above 36, so those two digits are certain. And you know six because that's the gradation. The gradations are always certain. You can always be certain whether or not it's past a line. It's that well, then you estimate one more digit, and that's the last significant figure. So this should be reported with four significant digits. Um, now, if you said it was 36.59 or 36.62 or whatever you estimated that last one to be, that's fine. That's your estimation. But make sure you have four significant figures in this measurement. Um, what? Yeah, but you'd be wrong. Yeah. It's important to always take your measurement with as many significant figures as the tool that you're using allows you to. I mean, the rest of your stuff will, will be right, but that part of it is, is okay. yeah. Okay, and then how do you convert it to Fahrenheit? Nine fifths times dash plus thirty. Nine fifths times dash plus thirty. <laughs> and what did you get for that? Ninety-seven point. Yeah, and make sure that that number is also reported in the appropriate um, with the appropriate precision. All right. Question.
Good first quiz, decent? Maybe? All right. Well, this kind of gives you an idea of what we're going to be looking at um, in future weeks with future quizzes. They won't always be straight out of the book, but they'll always be very similar to the problems from the book. So if you're doing all the problems per chapter, um, you should be in good shape. Here, you'll notice in notes number two, it's kind of the story. The story of the early history of chemistry, the fundamental laws that were discovered that kind of led to the atom and the proton and the neutron and electron and all that stuff. Um, I think it's fascinating, and you have a lot of real genius expressed here. Um, but I'm not sure that it's worth me just standing here and telling you about it. I think it's the sort of thing you can read, you can watch a video on, you can think about, or you can just ignore if you don't really care. Um, so I'm going to, as I promised, I'm going to try to tie this more to how will I ask you about this? What will I want you to master when we talk about these things? All right, so first I am going to tell you about these three laws, but then we're going to look at some specific problems that incorporate these ideas. Law of conservation of mass. Um, this, this seems pretty much, actually all of these, will seem pretty much uh, intuitive and like common sense now because they've been with us for so long. But when these came out, these things were absolutely, um, you know, earth-shaking, revolutionary ideas that got people killed and in trouble and, um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So, saying that in a chemical process, mass is neither created nor destroyed. Makes sense, right? You do a chemical reaction in a closed vessel, nothing gets out, so it almost still be in there somehow. But if you were a uh, pre-1789 type person, how might you be fooled into thinking that mass is not conserved? Give me an example of a chemical process where it doesn't seem like the mass might be conserved. Yeah, burning and uh, evapor evaporation are good examples. Pretty much any time something becomes an invisible gas, people pretty much assumed it didn't exist anymore. So you burned wood, the wood became energy, and, that, and, and the wood itself, the matter, actually disappeared. You just had the heat from the fire. You uh, left water out on the table, and it evaporated over a day because it was gone, and it didn't exist anymore, right, until... I don't know. I don't know if they knew about rain and stuff then. I don't know the history of those earth sciences. But so discovering through like weighing the products of these reactions that this actually didn't happen was a huge, uh, huge change. Um, all right. So the way we're going to use that, we're not going to do it right now. But when we start talking about chemical equations, this is why it's important to balance equations. This is why it's important to check yourself when you do uh, chemical equation calculations to make sure that you end up with as much stuff as you started with. Because if that's not the case, then something went wrong because you can't just make stuff disappear. Uh, and similarly, you can't just create mass. Um, so that'll come in uh, as uh, in the next chapter when we talk about uh, chemical equations. I guess it's in this chapter, just a little bit later. Um, okay, then these second two, these are a little bit clumsy in words, but I'll show you how it works in numbers and how we use this, and, and hopefully that will be um, helpful. So first, the law of definite proportion, a given compound always contains the same proportion of elements by mass. Does anybody want to try to tell me what that means? What, what, is, what do you mean that a compound contains the same proportion of elements by mass? That even though you have more, it's still the same ratio? Like, is that yeah. the same? Okay, yeah. Like the ratio doesn't change. Yeah, the ratio doesn't change, basically. So here's an example of how, the, of how this works. And again, this doesn't seem earth shattering right now, but you have to imagine that it sort of did at one time. And I'm not. Here it goes. Okay. So here's an example from your book The uh, Law of Definite Proportions. We'll look at their example, and then we'll do one of our own. You take some two different samples of carbon dioxide, and they're decomposed in their, into their constituent elements. One of them, you got 25.6 grams of oxygen, 9.6 grams of carbon. So this is something that could be done. You um, decompose it into its elements. And then the other one produces these different amounts of oxygen and carbon. You look at the two ratios, and you get the same ratio. 2.6 to 1 in both cases. 
Again, seems like common sense. Obviously, you take carbon dioxide, the, the amount of oxygen to the amount of carbon, that ratio should always be the same. But that wasn't clear back in the 1800s. It wasn't clear that carbon dioxide was something that was always the same and unchanging uh, in a, on a mass or atomic or whatever you want to call it, small enough perspective. That carbon dioxide from here should be the same as carbon dioxide in Europe or something. That wasn't obvious. Even like you took a rock, a, a pure sample of some mineral, it has the same proportion of elements in one part of the rock as in the other part of the rock. You take water. Water has the same proportion of hydrogen and oxygen all around it. It's not like it has a hydrogen-rich part on the surface and an oxygen-rich part underneath. So that was kind of a new thing. And the reason that it's important is that it proved that it proved the existence of compounds, that there were these things that were so um, tightly bound or tightly controlled that they were the same all throughout, as opposed to something like alloys or minerals where that might not be the case. And then the next big step to discovering atoms is called the law of multiple proportions, which said that uh, when you have a series of compounds, and this is really the big thing that kind of proved, or not proved, but, but led the way to talking about atoms. When you have a series of compounds of, say, nitrogen and oxygen, <coughs> the ratios of the masses, so the ratios that we just calculated from number two, will always be different by whole number increments. So this one, I think, takes some examples to figure out. So let's, whoops, let's say we have two samples of something that contains nitrogen and oxygen. We'll call it NXO. Why? Right. So two samples, they each have different amounts of, ox of nitrogen and oxygen. We'll call it NX1, OY1, and NX2, OY2. So think about this before thinking about atoms. Now, now that we know about atoms and formulas, we know that you can only have whole numbers for X and Y, right? Like you're not going to have n.5, y.7, or something like that. But before we knew about atoms, there would be no, way, no reason to think that. So why couldn't you have something that was 50% uh, each by mass, and then something that was 52% of one and 48% of one, or 53% of one and 47% of the other? So like, what they found was, in every case, when you made different combinations of n and o, those ratios were whole numbers. So here's, here's an example. Let's say NX1OY1, a little bit clunky, has uh, 2.28 grams of oxygen for every one gram of nitrogen. And then let's say number two here has 0 0.570 grams oxygen. All right. So you've got two different nitrogen oxides. And they probably have different properties. Maybe one's, well, I know, one's brown, one's colorless. You know, they might smell different. They might do different things. Um, so you definitely have two different, they knew that they had two different things. And then they'd calculate these mass, mass ratios. And every time they did this, they'd find that there was an integral difference, right? That means a whole number multiple. So let's calculate this out. The mass ratio. is 2.28 grams of oxygen per one gram of nitrogen uh, equals 2.28. And this mass ratio is 
is going to be 0 0.570 grams of oxygen per one gram of nitrogen, which is 0 0.570. All right, so there are two mass ratios. We'll call that mass ratio one and mass ratio two. And the ratio between those, mass ratio one and mass ratio two, is a whole number. And this always happens. Every possible compound of nitrogen and oxygen, you can do this kind of comparison from the masses, and you end up with a whole number. And so what this said was that there's something about counting going on here. It's not just about masses. There's actually a smallest piece. And you can't get smaller than that, because if you could get smaller than that, then you could have fractional amounts. <laughs> And since we only get whole numbers, there must be a smallest piece. And that smallest piece we now call the atom. So let's look at these compounds now um, and, and show what they actually are. So NX1, OY1, if you calculate these masses out, um, is actually NO2 and NX2, OY2 equals is N2O, or nitrous oxide. So nitrogen dioxide and nitrous oxide. And so where that 4 comes in is there's 4 times as many oxygen atoms per nitrogen in NO2 as there is in N2O. So that's that ratio. But without knowing that there was the smallest piece, um, you wouldn't be able to, to come up with that. All right, so that's kind of what proved that there's the smallest thing. Um, and then we go through and we talk about the atom, the basic um, atomic theory. There's these tiny particles. They get combined in different ways through chemical reactions. Like I said, I'm not going to go through this whole history. You can look at it. Um, and so then there were some various experiments to characterize atoms and, and the parts of the atoms. Here's an experiment that showed how an electron was first identified. Um, has anybody ever heard of a cathode ray tube? Have you seen those? That's basically a TV uh, or an old monitor, you know, the thing with like, the big fat ones that, that they used to have. What that is, is it's shooting electrons at a screen that when the electron hits the screen, it glows. And that's what gave the light. So it, it was called a cathode ray because they thought it was a ray, like light. Didn't think it was an actual particle. But what, um, what was discovered here in the, around just the end of last century uh, was Thompson's experiment with a cathode ray tube where he would put a magnet around it and an electric field and found that both a magnet and an electric field would bend this ray. And no other light ray can be bent by an electric field or uh, a magnet. Right? They just go straight through. So the fact that this bent meant that it was actually something negatively charged, not just uh, light. And that kind of led to, the, led to the development of that it was an electron, so they, they figured out the charge to mass ratio. Um, this other oil drop experiment, um, how, it was how we figured out the mass of the electron. You can read about that if you're interested. We'll talk about radiation in a bit. OK, let's look at the final experiment that kind of tells us the structure of the atom. Because once all those particles were kind of figured out, the idea was that um, you had this thing called a plum pudding model, where I'm going to talk about this experiment, but just look at those, those spheres first. The idea was you had kind of um, everything mixed up in the atom. You had a, a positive mass, a positive thing, right? And then the electrons were kind of all distributed through there. And that was what was thought was what an atom was. Everything was basically distributed through evenly. 
What this experiment showed was what we now know of atomic structure, where you have a nucleus in the middle with concentrated positive charge, and then electrons pretty far away um, on the outside of that, relatively far away. And the experiment was to shoot a beam of alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, through a piece of gold foil. Now, if that were the structure of the atom, you would expect them to just kind of go through, because they were big, heavy particles compared to these things. And you would expect they would just either go through the, the gold foil or maybe get displaced a little bit. But instead, they saw something crazy. They saw deflections almost straight back. They saw huge bends uh, in various directions. And that showed that those positive charges were interacting with other very dense positive regions. And that proved that you actually have a nucleus where the, charge, the positive charge is dense and in the center rather than dispersed through the whole atom. So that's the idea there. All right, and now we know a t modern, modern atomic structure has protons and neutrons in the nucleus, right? And then you have electrons around it. We'll talk about that in more detail because chemistry really comes from the electrons. But one thing I want to show you in this thing is look at the difference in, in size between the size of a nucleus and the size of an atom. Now this changes from atom to atom. But the nucleus is on the order of 10 to the minus 14th meters. And the atom is on the order of 10 to the minus 10th meter, uh, meters. So 10,000 times bigger. Which means the space between a nucleus and an electron is about 10,000 times bigger. Well, half that, uh, depending on how you count it than the thing itself, which really what that tells us is that almost everything in the world is space. Right. Things that we think of as solid are really mostly empty space. Not air, empty space. There's far more empty space in this table than there is actual protons, neutrons, and electrons because there's so much space in between them. And that's a little bit crazy to think about, I think. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, a couple things that, that we'll talk about more. We use a couple different numbers for mass. Of course, we all know the basic kilogram unit for mass or gram. We don't use kilograms and grams when we talk about protons, neutrons, and electrons because they're so small and they have these, these kind of crazy numbers. And if every time you wanted to weigh some atoms, you use that, you would be a little bit, you know, it would be annoying. So we use something called atomic mass units, which is based on um, how much a, a particular amount of an atom weighs. And you'll see those numbers there. But basically, it's a conversion so that a proton is about 1 and a neutron is about 1. And that way, we can estimate what, a, um, what an atom is going to weigh just based on its protons and neutron count. And the electrons weigh so little that they contribute pretty much negligibly to the uh, overall atomic mass. OK, so that was a quick, um, quick survey of some of this history. Now let's get into some more stuff. All right, so what do we actually have to do? We have to be able to count these things. And we have to be able to know what makes uh, these elements different. So an atom doesn't have a charge, right? What do we call a charged particle? An ion, right? And the elements, and this is the really crucial part, are always identified by the number of protons. Okay? We don't care about the other, sub, the other atomic particles. You've got 20 protons, you've got calcium. You've always got calcium. doesn't matter if you have one electron or 50 electrons. Not going to happen either way, but that's still calcium. Similar with neutrons. doesn't matter how many neutrons are there. We still call it calcium if it has 20 protons. So. We can figure out a couple things about some of those other particles. If we know that something is not charged, if we know a calcium atom is not charged, then we know that there must be an equal number of protons and neutrons. All right? So calcium atoms, not ions, but atoms, will always have 20 protons and 20 electrons. But the number of neutrons can differ. So what's the word for something with different numbers of neutrons? Isotopes. Isotopes of calcium would be atoms that had 20 electrons and 20 protons, but maybe 
40 neutrons, or 41 neutrons, or 42 neutrons, or, sorry, 20 neutrons, 21 neutrons, or 22 neutrons, something like that. And the way that we express these is either like this or like this, which specifies how many neutrons, well, it specifies how many protons are there in the first case, but then it also tells you how many neutrons are there because it has to add up to the overall uh, mass. So if it's calcium 40, that means you have 20 protons and 20 neutrons. So this would be 20 protons and 20 neutrons. The 40 is the mass number, not the number of uh, neutrons, which is the, the sum of the two. So you, to find uh, neutrons, you just subtract top from, or bottom from top? Right. Okay. And often, it's actually, often it's, it can be written like this also, because that bottom number is really redundant. Right? Saying that it's got 20 protons and that it's calcium is saying the same thing, because the element is identified by the number of protons that it has. So if we said this, you could do the same thing. You just have to look it up on a periodic table to find the 20. Because you find calcium, Ca, you know that's 20. You subtract 40 for 20, from 20, you've got 20 neutrons. Some terms for that. Atomic number is the number of protons. It's, known, it's also known as the Z number. That's the identifying number, the, which on the periodic table is always in blue on the upper, not always, is, on that periodic table is in blue on the upper right-hand corner. It's usually on the top of the box. And then we're going to talk about the bottom one in a second. So one thing that we're going to see here um, are a couple ways that these things come together. Now, we're going to go through this in detail. I just want to give you a sense of it right now. Um, there are a couple ways that these things can bond together. What are they? There are two ways that atoms bond together, covalent, covalent and Ionic bonds. So those are the two types of bonds that you'll see. Um, and then we'll use formulas like this, right? We'll call that a chemical formula. Structural formula are things like this. What does that line represent? It represents a covalent bond. And we'll talk about what that means um, it later in great detail. It's two shared electrons. Again, we'll get into that. Here are some other ways that you might see atoms, or, or you might see molecules drawn. All right? here's a formula. There's a structural formula. And then ball and stick is basically the same as structural, but usually in 3D with balls and sticks. And space filling is trying to give us a sense of what that thing actually looks like because atoms are really spheres. They're not in the end of sticks. They're just kind of lumped together. So, that, so you may see things expressed in that way as well. OK, now ions. You've probably heard of ions before. We talked about it. If it has a net positive or negative charge, what does that tell you about its protons and neutrons? They're different. They're out of balance. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons are negatively, or electrons are negatively charged. So if they're out of balance, then the overall particle will have a positive or negative charge. All right, so as an example, here is potassium metal. Right? It's just written as K. If you have potassium metal, how many protons does an atom of potassium have? 19, right. How many electrons does an atom of potassium have? And how many neutrons? Well, we don't really know because we don't know which isotope it is, but we'll get into that in a minute. We know it has 19 protons and 19 electrons. If you lose an electron from potassium, So it loses an electron. Then we have how many protons? Still 19 protons. And how many electrons? 18, because we lost one. So what we do is say that there's now an overall net positive charge of 1. 
And to express that, we put a little plus up there. So it's no longer K, it's K plus, or potassium ion. And what are the words for ions? What do we call a positively charged ion? Well, you got the words just a little bit. So let's, let's all be clear about that. A cation is positively charged, and an anion is negatively charged. <coughs> and so an anion, the opposite thing happens. So you take something like chlorine, which has how many protons? 17. And how many electrons? And now we're going to add an electron to chlorine. Chlorine can absorb an electron. And so now we have a chlorine with 17 protons and 18 electrons. And we call that Cl minus. Do I have this word down here? Let me check. No. Oh, okay. I want to show you one term. So notice, notice what we just did. These two ions, K plus and Cl minus, both have 18 electrons. You see that? So there's a word for that. Anybody know what it means, what, what it is? You heard this word? The word is isoelectronic. So we can say K plus and Cl minus are isoelectronic, which means they have the same number of electrons. Can two different atoms be isoelectronic? Can two different atoms be isoelectronic? Why? Or how, I guess. Which, which two atoms could be isoelectronic? Well, what does isoelectronic mean? Same number of electrons. So can two uncharged atoms have the same number of electrons? Different ones? They can't, right? Because if you have different number of protons, and the protons and electrons have to be equal, then they can't have the same number of electrons either. So only ions, and we'll talk about molecules and other stuff, but not atoms can be isoelectronic. And so let's look at the periodic table a little bit. Got a big one here. Got one up on the wall. Let's look at the two uh, things that we just talked about. So we've got potassium here, and we've got chlorine over here. Just based on nothing, except what we've just done or what you've seen in the past, can you make some generalizations about what kinds of ions might be common? based on where they are in the periodic table? Any guesses? Could be anything. Yeah, what, what do you think about the group? We have to how it is, but it has certain amounts of electrons or charges. Yeah, and we'll get into this in a few, uh, well, actually a while, several weeks, a few chapters. But basically, you know, stuff over here is generally OK with losing electrons. And stuff over here is generally okay with gaining electrons. Right. And, and so that we'll see that a lot. So ionic bonding comes apart, comes about when you have attraction between ions. Electrons aren't actually shared. You just have two particles. So it's wrongly, it's often wrongly written that sodium chloride is something like this. Okay, that's not right. That line, as we talked about before, indicates two shared electrons. Ionic bonds are really just attractions. We call it a bond. But what it really is is just some negative stuff being attracted to some positive stuff and them hanging out around each other. And that's pretty much it. They don't really interact in any meaningful way the way that a covalent, um, that covalently bond atoms will. So the other part of that is that this is usually very much, much, much stronger. So salts 
which is another word for ionic compounds or ionic solids, tend to have really high melting points, be really stable, all of that. And since you've been studying your, your ions, right, we're going to start talking about that now and some of these names of these ions. Now one thing, we'll get into this um, later, but we, we know this is chloride, we know this is bromide, and the positive ions, they don't change their name. So that's just sodium and potassium. But we'll talk about that in, in uh, chapter is it three. We'll be really systematic about this is how you name this, this is how you name this. So this is kind of an intro. Sorry. It's all right. Okay. So now let's do some masses. Have you heard this word before, stoichiometry? It's a dumb word. Um, it's a terrible word. And the reason for that, of course my opinion, maybe you like it, we can fight later. Um, <laughs> but just don't punch me because I'm pretty weak. Anyway, stoichiometry, it's a big fancy word and it's kind of scary. And everybody says like, oh, you have to take chemistry and learn how to do stoichiometry and learn how to do stoichiometry problems and it's very tricky. It's not tricky. It just means the amount of stuff Right? The amount of stuff that you use, the amount of stuff consumed and produced, the quantities. It's another word for quantities. Uh, I don't know why we have to use a fancy word for it, but it's, it's not fancy. It's just how much stuff are you using, how much stuff are you making. And we're going to do a bunch of those kinds of calculations in various ways, and some of them will be tricky, but the basic concept is just stuff, the amount of stuff that you use or make in a chemical reaction. All right. So to do that, we have to be um, a little bit more specific about how we measure mass. N remember before, we talked about this difference between the masses we measure in a lab, like grams and kilograms, and this new thing, atomic mass units. So here's where the atomic mass unit comes from. One atom of carbon, of this isotope carbon-12, is assigned a mass of exactly 12 atomic mass units. Right? So one atom of that is 12. We just call it that. It's complete arbitrary distinction. We just say this thing, this atom of carbon-12 is going to weigh 12. It's going to weigh 12 atomic mass units. Done. Everything else is set based on that standard. Okay. So how do we actually determine the mass of an individual atom? We can't weigh it on a balance. Right? Balance isn't going to register one atom. We're talking about 10 to the minus whatever kilograms. So we use something called a mass spectrometer, which you're going to use um, next week in lab. And ours is a little bit different now, but this is the basic idea, or certainly how they started out. You put a sample in this instrument, and an electron v beam ionizes it. What does it mean to ionize something? Yeah. Give it a charge, yeah, turn it into an ion. How do you think uh, an electron beam ionizes a sample? Any ideas? Or, yeah, uh, actually it's the opposite. It would make more sense for it to add an electron, but actually it knocks an electron off of it. But same idea. Um, yeah, you knock an electron off of the atom, and it becomes an ion. It becomes charged. And then you accelerate it through this thing, pass it through a magnetic field, and the lightest particles will be um, kind of diverted the most, and the heaviest ones will be diverted the least, because right? they'll feel the force the least, from wherever your magnet is or however you're going to do it. In this diagram, I believe the magnet, um, no, it's the opposite. Yeah, because it's the opposite. So in this diagram, the lightest particles go through into the center, are not diverted, and the magnet will pull, have the biggest pull on the heaviest particles. Um, pulling them away. So I think that's how this one's set up. You know, they're all different. It just depends on, on what the detector is and everything. The idea is now you can separate things based on this deviation, and if you calibrate it, you know, okay, this is this mass, this is this mass, this is this mass. So you can actually weigh individual atoms and molecules, and we'll do that next week. Now, in a lab, that's not really convenient, right? If you need to weigh out some carbon to do your reaction, you're not going to put it through a mass spectrometer and weigh it every element at a t every atom at a time and try to get each atom to be collected somewhere. It's probably not even possible. So we have to find another way to do that. 
and we'll we'll get into that probably not today. But let's talk about this. All right, so carbon 12. We set it as 12. Carbon weighs 12. An atom of carbon weighs 12. If you look at the periodic table, you have a bunch of red numbers. Those are the atomic masses in atomic mass units. Why isn't carbon 12? We set carbon to be 12. So why isn't the mass of carbon 12 atomic mass units? Why is it 12.011? Yeah, what about the natural world? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that every atom is different? Like, like I mean, 12 is just the most common uh, number of, like, it could be like 13 or, you know. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not that every atom is different. That's, you know, most of them are the same. Yeah. But there are different isotopes. So the answer here is that there are different isotopes. And primarily with carbon, carbon-12 is about 99% uh, of the carbon in the world is carbon-12. And each atom of that weighs exactly 12 atomic mass units. But there's also carbon-13 in the world. It's about 0.1%. There's also carbon-14 in the world which is even less than that. I think it's about less than 0.01%. That's what's used for carbon dating, for instance. So carb the carbon in the world is not just carbon-12. It's a mixture of these different carbons. And the mass on the periodic table is an average, is a weighted average of isotopes. Okay. So the mass on the periodic table is a weighted average of all the isotopes. So it's 98.89%, so about 99% times 12, plus this percent times 13 equals 12.01. And then you can you know, put the 14 in there and everything else. So that weighted average gives you the number on the periodic table. And this is going to be important for your lab next week. You're going to have to do this because the, the mass spectrometer actually gives you the individual isotopes. So you're going to see the individual isotopes, and then you're going to have to do this calculation to get the overall average mass. All right. And so one last thing then, and we'll get into the mole next time. Even though carbon does not contain an atom with mass 12.01, we just talked about that. There's carbon 12. There's carbon-13, there's carbon-14. There's no carbon-12.01. When we're doing our calculations, when we're calculating stuff for chemical reactions, we can assume that carbon is only one type of atom, and that type of atom is a mass of 12.01. Is that correct? But why can we assume that? Why does that work? Yeah, why don't you know? Well, that's true, but I mean, why, why can we assume that all the carbon in the world is the same and it's 12.01? Why don't we have to account for the fact that there's some carbon-12 and some carbon-13 when we do calculations in the lab or when we measure stuff out in the lab by mass? It's a pretty simple a answer. It's, I'm not trying to trick you or anything. It will be both. In fact, it will always be both, right? These things are so small that you're never going to get in a situation where you're measuring it out and you've accidentally taken a bunch of carbon-12 but left, left some of the carbon-13 behind. I mean, every time you take a little scoop of carbon, you're talking about trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions and more of atoms. So the, fact, so the chance that you would ever have a different ratio than exactly that 99% to 1% or whatever is, is really unlikely, really unlikely. You're always going to have all of it. So you can assume you don't have to worry about the individual masses of elements or of atoms unless you're like using a mass spectrometer. Any other case, you're always going to get all of it because there's just so many. Okay. All right, so we'll stop there and uh, continue on Monday talking about the mole.